that's just yes or no? No. And Mark, of course, was in the same residence with you? Correct. Who was it who was talking to, to Mr. Jackson about, specifically about, what he needed to do with regards to Debbie Rowe? Mark and Dieter. Were both of them speaking at different times with Mr. Jackson with regards to Debbie Rowe? Together and separate. What is it that Mark told Mr. Jackson he needed to do with regards to Debbie Rowe? Objection. Hearsay and leading. Overruled. Go ahead. He needed to call her and talk to her. Okay. Give her permission. All right. Something about permission. Uh-huh. Okay. What did Dieter say to Mr. Jackson with regards to Debbie Rowe? Objection. Foundation and hearsay. Overruled. Go ahead. That he needed, that all he needed to do was talk to her so that she could do the rebuttal. All right, permission so far. Doesn't sound like anything illegal going on. We'll get into that a little bit later. Frederick Mark Schaffel and Dieter Wiesner are former associates of Jackson. Later, you'll hear another name, Vinny, referring to Vinny Amin, yet another former associate and unindicted co-conspirator of Michael Jackson. Okay, let's move on down the road to the accuser's family and damage control. Did Mr. Weisner or Mr. Schaffel ask Michael Jackson to do anything with regards to the family? Well, Frank had told him that... Objection. Non-responsive. Yes or no? Yes. All right. And who was it? Dieter or Schaffel or both? Both. Let's start with Mr. Schaffel. What did Mr. Schaffel say with regards to Mr. Jackson with regards to this family? Objection. Hearsay. Overruled. You may answer. Go ahead. That they could ruin your career. They could blackmail you. All right. Did Mr. Weisner say anything to Mr. Jackson? Essentially the same thing. You know, essentially the same thing. Was there a conversation between Mr. Weisner and Mr. Jackson about a rebuttal? Yes. What did Mr. Weisner say to Mr. Jackson about a rebuttal? Objection. Hearsay. Overruled. You may answer. To the best of your recollection. That we, that they needed to do it. Did he say why they needed to do this rebuttal? To save Michael's image, his career. Objection. Hearsay. Overruled. And did he talk at all about this being a money raiser in any way? Oh, yeah. This could make money. And that's what Mr. Weisner said to Mr. Jackson? Both of them did. All right, gang. Before we get into the nitty-gritty of what this witness says, because we're going to be with him a while today, let's talk about this being the last witness of the prosecution's case impressions. Well, they wanted to have him be a real bang-up witness because they wanted him to be the person who put the nail in the coffin and put Michael Jackson right in the conspiracy. However, as we shall see, sometimes what you think you're getting is not what you're getting. Uh, right, right. Not, not credible. Not credible. And they fail to do exactly what Ricky said they hope to do. All this seems to show is that there's a conspiracy to make a rebuttal video. Well, and, and that may and, be and very James, well be true. James, why is this guy taking notes for openers? That's suspect. And at the conversation of January 1st, I'm surprised they were planning to video before the Bashir documentary aired. Well, he obviously has his dates wrong, but so no, do lots or of other lying, people. Ricky. Well, or he's I, lying, Ricky. I don't even know why we're debating, though, seriously, if he's lying, because he doesn't say anything yet that hurts Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson obviously did need to shore up things after the Bashir video and make a new video. Well, well but and that so, is indeed the question. So, but that's right. yet another question, is it not, folks? Did Michael Jackson think? He needed to shore up the aftermath from the Bashir video, or were it, was it just the people around him? Next, directing Jackson's ex in the now infamous rebuttal video. Was Mr. Schaffel making any suggestions as how to answer the questions to Debbie Rowe? Objection as leading. Overruled. You may answer. Yes. In what way? What was he saying? Objection. Hearsay. It's not for the truth of the matter stated. The objection is overruled. Tell us in what way. He would prod her to do it better or say it better like any producer would. How often did he do that with regards to the questions? The frequency with which the questions were asked. How often would he offer suggestions? A lot. That's what he was there the whole time and he was working on things at the same time. He would write things and scratch it out and then she would redo it. Was Debbie Rowe responsive to his suggestions? Yes. Now, grabbing an Oscar isn't the only incentive for apparently a moving performance. Was there a conversation about her seeing her children? Well... Objection. Leading. Overruled. You may answer. He said, you're going to see your kids soon. Objection. Non-responsive hearsay. Move to strike. It's stricken. Well, but the answer would be yes or no. Was there a conversation specifically about her kids? 
Yes. What did Mr. Schaffel say to her about her kids? Objection. Hearsay. Overruled. Go ahead. That you were doing good, you are going to see them soon, or something like that. Were there times when you were watching this interview when Miss Rowe was crying? Yes. Was there any discussion between Mr. Schaffel and Ms. Rowe about her crying at other times? Yes. Would you explain that to us, please? Objection. Hearsay. Vague. Overruled. You may answer. Go ahead. Okay. He thought she could cry better. And did they do the scene again? Pretty much. Yeah. Well, not pretty much. They did. And did she cry when they redid it? She cried better. This seems pretty damaging, doesn't it? No. At least on some level? No. Why no. not? I'll tell you why. Because if there was a conspiracy, and the prosecution obviously thinks that there was, then Mark Schaffel is at the center of it. So sure. the jurors have got to wonder, why isn't he charged? Why is Michael Jackson charged? Well, he is Mark indeed Schaffel, charged. Well, well, uncharged. He's uncharged. named in the first count. So no. is he what? charged or uncharged? That it would be well, the here to testify. He is unindicted. Unindicted. Yeah. unindicted. Yeah. Unindicted, meaning uncharged. And, and that it is allows... damaging. It is damaging. Why? I'm going to say agree with you, at least if that wasn't rhetorical. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the idea really Let's is... Let's hope for the prosecution's sake it wasn't rhetorical. Because what the idea is, according to Gavin's mom, Janet, is that it was scripted and it was rehearsed and it was done over and over again. And so Debbie Rowe, same thing. She says, no, I did it my own way, my way. I did it my exactly, way, exactly. but here they're saying, wait, cry a little better, and she cried but a little Shaffle, better. But it's all Shaffle. But it's even not if Jackson. it's Shaffle, and even if there's a connection between Shaffle and Michael Jackson, being on television just a little bit, we understand that producers will give you uh, an opportunity to do it a little bit differently, or a little bit better. I could conceive of a situation where she starts to cry, perhaps holds back, and the producer says, look, go ahead, let it go. It's okay to you cry. You know, but the bottom line, and Ricky touched on it earlier, this rebuttal video is a non-issue. Michael Jackson should want to make the rebuttal video, rebuttal video look as say? good as he can. Of course. Certainly, certainly. And the timing of the video, once again, folks, lest we all forget with respect to the alleged molestation. There is the video, then apparently the molestation. Hmm. When we return, we once again hear about that horrible term, killers. Killers endangering the accuser's family. But this time, it's not Janet doing the talking. Stay with us. The reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. As Assistant District Attorney Ron Zonin continues to question Jackson Associate Rudy Provencio, the K-word comes back in the play. Yeah, what could that be? Well, you're going to hear it right now as the jury heard it according to the courtroom transcripts. Tell me about the conversation with Mark Schaffel involving the word killer. Well, well objection hearsay. Overruled. Go ahead. He said, uh, well, he made a flippant remark about the killers, and I was kind of trying to figure out what was happening here. So I said to him, I said, well, what, what killers? And he said, the killers that are after the... Uh, and I, I think I'm pronouncing the name right. And I said, hmm, because I thought, well, maybe I should be... Objection, non-responsive, narrative. Narrative sustained. All right. He said the killers that were after the Is that correct? Correct. Did he say anything else about the killers? No, that was the first time I was hearing about it. So it was a flippant remark. Did you ever hear the word killers prior to that? Never. Did you ask him about that to explain further? Yes. And what did you ask him? I said, who were the killers? And what did he say? Objection, hearsay. Overruled. You may answer. What did he say? He says the killers that are after the family. I mean, he didn't really go into it. That was the first time I was hearing about it, so... Did he offer any further explanation? No, that was alarming because... Objection. Move to strike. Strike the last sentence. Were you alarmed by those comments? Absolutely. Approximately how long after your conversation with Mark Schaffel was it that you had the conversation with Vinny? Well, I raced over to the phone and picked up the phone and called him. So immediately? Well, immediately. All right. What did you ask Vinny? Who the heck are the killers? What did he say? He goes, there are no killers. Did he say anything beyond that? He said that, that they were calling him a, a faggot at school and that that was really it. It was just so, it was another kid or something, I don't know, but he just said that they were calling him a faggot at school, so... Was that the end of the conversation? Pretty much. 
Hmm, killers, calling him a faggot at school. Maybe that conversation came out of, well, you see what I mean. As the direct examination continues, don't you have to be a prisoner first before you can escape? Did you have a conversation with anybody among the people who worked for Michael Jackson at that time about escape or escaping from Neverland? Objection, leading, overruled. Yes. All right. With whom did you have that conversation? With Mark and Vinny again. Okay. At the same time or at separate times? Separate times. With whom did you first speak about that subject? Mark. And what did Mark say to you? Objection, hearsay. Overruled. What did he say to you? I can't talk right now. They just escaped. Was there any further discussion with him at that point? No, he just got off the phone. It was kind of ugly. You were talking to him over the telephone? Yes. All right. Did he make any further qualifications on that? No. Did you have... But the word escaped was the word he used. He used escaped. Howard Weissman, give us a quick legal uh, primer for you with respect to this hearsay. Hearsay being stuff that people say that aren't in court, essentially. A very, yes. very shorthand explanation. But what is it about these folks being so-called unindicted co-conspirators that allows other people to come in and testify about what they, those unindicted co-conspirators, said someplace um, else? The theory is if the statements are in furtherance of the conspiracy, then their statements can come in and be used against whoever the defendant or the accused is in a trial. I think that's loosely applied in this But the problem here, trial. Ricky, is that there's no cross-examination of these supposed folks who said these supposed things. Well, of course, and that's always the problem with hearsay. And more context more, for that matter. And more of a problem for unindicted co-conspirators. But what one unindicted co-conspirator says is attributable to any other yes. unindicted or in the case of Michael Jackson, indicted co-conspirator. And they're still having trouble making that connection on cross-examination. Defense attorney Tom Mesro questions the producer's motives for taking interest in the accuser's family. Because of your concern for the family, you were taking contemporaneous notes, true? For my concern for the family, I took notes because I wanted to see what was happening. Okay, that was your only purpose, correct? Well, I thought it was fishy, and so much was moving so quickly that if I didn't write things down, I wouldn't remember things. So I wrote them down as they were happening. And your only purpose was a concern for the family, true? Well, yeah, because I wanted to know what was happening. Something fishy was going on. No, I understand. I understand. And because something fishy was going on, you thought you would just take notes of everything that was happening, right? I took notes because I knew things were moving so quickly that unless I kept track of what was going on, I wasn't sure what was happening with this family because people were all saying different things. I understand. And have you ever discussed the possibility of writing a book based on your notes? No. When you first met the sheriffs, did you tell them you had taken notes? At first, maybe. Probably not. I didn't want to get involved, really. You were listening in on phone calls without them knowing about it. True? That's true. Okay. And you were doing this because you were so concerned that something wrong might be going on. Is that correct? Well, it's not that sarcastic, but I was concerned about the family. Right, right. But you didn't even know the family, correct? You didn't need to. Something was fishy. Something was going wrong. I see. And did you call the police immediately and say something wrong is going on? No, because nobody would believe me, so I... You just kept working for Shaffle, listening to phone calls, hearing what wrong was going on, and never called the police, right? I was trying to figure out what was going on. You know, is it like witness school that you never call the police because nobody's going to believe you? Is that something they teach? Okay, I'm channeling Howard Weitzman. Next, Mesro presses on, questioning the accuracy of the witness's notes. Sir, you went back and wrote these notes because you wanted to be involved in this case, didn't you? No, God, no, and ruined my career. It just happens all the dates are wrong. Well, not all the dates are wrong. All object is argumentative. Sustained. Did you tell Sergeant Rubel in your interview on January 31st, 2004, words to the effect, Mark directed everything? It's unknown if Michael Jackson knew about what was going on with the family? Yes, I wrote that, or said that, sorry. Now, you told Sergeant Rubel in that interview that when the Bashir taping of Living with Michael Jackson was aired in the U.S., 
Schaffel immediately contacted Weisner and Conitzer, right? Correct. I believe Dieter was staying at the ranch at the time. Can I say something? No. Please? <laughs> All right. You know, the jurors don't understand this idea of the unindicted co-conspirator. I mean, we sat here and we sure. don't really understand it. They're sitting here hearing all of this testimony about Mark Schaffel and Dieter and all of these people doing this so-called conspiracy, and Michael Jackson's nowhere in it. They've got to wonder, why are these people well, not judged? Well, they've got to appreciate, though, Michael don't Jackson, they, Ricky, the idea the that these are Jackson's associates, employees, and they make the, may make the connection themselves. Sure, if I were arguing this case for the prosecution closing argument, I'd call them Jackson's henchmen. Absolutely. But they've got to oh. have one, that's what I'd argue, oh. but they need one moment, one <laughs> moment that you got to tie Michael Jackson in there. They don't have And it. the only way they have it is by the testimony, really, yeah. of Debbie Rowe. It's gonna Who says they be worked amongst themselves? Tight. Work that hand. They're going to work amongst <laughs> themselves. <laughs> when we return, Mesereau's final attack on a witness for the prosecution. Stay with us. The reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. As the cross-examination of producer Rudy Provincial continues, defense attorney Tom Mesro has a little itty-bitty problem with Provincial's timing. Here's what he told jurors according to the courtroom transcripts. Did you tell Sergeant Rebell everything you knew on that date? No, because I didn't. It's not something, it wasn't something I was thinking about for a while. So it was, you know, I told him what I knew at that particular time. And the first time you ever produced anything to the sheriffs referring to escape or killers was a few weeks ago, right? Well, that was when I found it because I didn't think I had it anymore, so, but I always kept journals, so not all of them that I, Still have so well. Would it be uh, would it be accurate to say that even though you told Sergeant Rebell you would tell him everything you knew on January 31st, 2004, you just forgot about the escape on that date? No, I I told him what I knew based on the questions he was asking me, and I was being honest at that time. You gave them your journal notes a few weeks ago, didn't you? No, I continuously give them notes. The notes you were referring to earlier that have a February 1st date are notes you gave them a couple of weeks ago? That's true, from the Neverland Valley book, right. Had you given them some notes before that recent date? Well, it was an ongoing investigation, so I gave them notes all along. I was keeping in contact with people, so... You didn't give them any of your notes until a few weeks ago, right? Any of my notes? No. Objection. Sustained. Howard, he's fudging. He's fudging big time. No, James, he's he less knows than that, truthful. Go ahead. <laughs> he's less than truthful. Just a little bit, apparently. This guy is confused and indicated that nobody would believe him. Well, why would they believe somebody who eavesdrops on conversations, <laughs> takes notes, and, and, and I think he's testified, writes them as, as the ongoing investigation takes place? This is a pathetic witness and speaks volumes about what the prosecution's case is. And this is, is Sean Chapman Hall, I believe it was you or perhaps Ricky, um, talked about the idea of primacy and recency, which right. is that basic concept of jurors and anybody who's listening to you remembers what you do first, what you do last. Right. Everything in the middle sort of goes together. This is not an, this is no. an inauspicious yeah. ending. This was their last witness, their last opportunity to tie Michael Jackson into this so-called conspiracy, and they failed to do it. He was another lackluster witness who lacks credibility. They, this was a bad witness. I think the prosecution would know that in and of itself. One, the only way that they resurrect themselves when they argue to the jury, which could be tomorrow or many, many tomorrows away, yes. is the reality of saying, these are the people that Michael Jackson chose to surround himself with. We didn't create these people. Michael Jackson chose these people. That's got to be a pretty good argument. No? Doesn't make him any more credible. Here's somebody, as you said, is fudging on the stand under oath and indicates that he was, he was producing notes as each day went on. Yeah. And you know what the inference is? That he was creating the notes exactly. before he produced and the, the notes. And the business about this killers and captives and other stuff doesn't appear and in the notes originally. The question is whether or not the judge is going to grant the motion to dismiss well, this charge. Well, they're never granted, so we're not going to be surprised. <laughs> be sure to watch me? our exclusive coverage of the Michael Jackson <laughs> trial tomorrow night, 7.30, when the defense launches its case. Will they call Macaulay Calkin? Find out right here on E!